you, know, you figure out how wrong it is. And right. then if it's really wrong, you adjust the weights a lot. And if it's just a little bit wrong, you adjust them a little bit. Right, exactly. So that's exactly right. What you need to do is you compare the output, like the probability. Let's say this was a cat. So the correct output should be 100%, right? You want the network to say for sure it's a cat. But let's say this neuron output 0 0.2. So it's saying that this is not a cat for sure. It's just 20% sure, uh, certainty that it's a cat. So it's, it's kind of wrong. So this difference 1 and 0 0.2, that's the error of your network. And based on how large this error is, you're going to start to fix these weights somehow. And how do you do that? Uh, by using the backpropagation algorithm, what it does essentially is to compute like what is the blame, like how responsible each one of these neurons is for um, for this mistake that the network uh, made, right? So, uh, and these are called the delta values. Some people use a different variable name. Whenever I see backpropagation, I see people using delta, it doesn't make a difference. So, let's say intuitively how responsible this, this neuron is for the mistake that the network just made. If it was supposed to be the output was supposed to be 1, but the output of this neuron was 0 0.2. What do you guys think the delta of this guy should be? How, how wrong that neuron is? 0 0.8, right? The output should be 1, it was 0 0.2. So the delta of this guy is 0 0.8. This is how, how much it contributed to the error of the network. Now the, the hard question is, if you know that this guy contributed 0 0.8, how much are these neurons contributing to this mistake? That's what backpropagation tells you. So let's say that the connection, the weight connecting these two neurons is zero. What is the delta of this one? How much is this guy contributing to that error? Nothing. Hmm? Nothing. Nothing, right? Because this guy is out, this neuron is outputting some number, but it's multiplied by zero if this weight is zero. So whatever error this uh, neuron is is making, it's for sure not being influenced by this this guy because the weight here is zero. So backpropagation is just a way of formalizing this intuition, and you can compute the delta of this guy, and then after you compute the delta at the last layer, you can compute the delta of the neurons that come before and so on. So you sort of assign blame to each one of the neurons based on how much the network, uh, what was the, the final error. And then what it also tells you, backpropagation, uh, how to use these delta values, which are numbers, like right, real numbers, to compute the, the gradients of each one of these weights. So it's just a simple formula. You don't have to know this by heart. Nobody memorizes this. Most people don't. Um, and then the question is, like, I know that the current value of this weight, and I, and I computed the gradient of this weight using this delta values. How do you use this weight, this uh, gradient, now to improve the network? Oh, a better question is, what is the intu intuitive meaning of the, the gradient of the weight? Does anyone know? Yeah, sorry. Uh, do you think it means how fast it's changing? How fast what is changing? The weight. Because you're adjusting the weights, are you not? You want to adjust the weight. Yeah. But so the gradient is, you're right, the gradient is saying that something is changing, but the weight is it's just a number in your code, right? It's not changing on its own. Maybe that's how fast and in which direction does it change? The change of what? The weight. <laughs> no. <laughs> so the weight is not changing. The weight is, is constant. It's a constant in your model, right? What you want to know is how much you should change, but the weight itself is not changing on, it, on its own. What this gradient is telling you is how much the error of the network is changing would change if you change this weight a little bit. So let's say if the gradient is a million, so it's a really large number, that means that if you change this weight a little bit, the error is going to change a lot. So this, by changing this weight, maybe the network is, is going to make uh, much better predictions or much worse predictions. So that's what the gradient is telling you. It's the gradient of the performance of this network. <coughs> right? So there's a cost function. I'm not going through the math, but that's the intuition. This is basically saying 
So let's say this, this gradient is a positive number, like 100, plus 100. That means that if you increase this weight, the error of the network is going to increase also. That's the intuition. If the gradient is negative, like minus 100, that means that if you increase the weight, the error of the network is going to decrease because the gradient is negative. Everybody remembers this? This is gradient descent? Okay, uh, so, so that's how you use this gradient information. The, si uh, the sign of this thing basically tells, tells you if you should increase the weight to make the network better or if you should decrease the weight. All right, any questions so far? Is this something completely crazy? Um, what would you do if you have an activation function that isn't uh, derivative? For if it's not what? Uh, differentiable. Differentiable. Oh, got it. Like a uh, softmax or like a. Softmax is different. differentiable. Softmax is differentiable. Okay. What about Renmu? Like, uh, yeah. I think real Renmu is not differentiable in one point, mm -hmm. and in most cases you don't care about it. It works in most cases. It should work in all cases. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, that's a good question, but I mean that's going kind of deeper than I that I wanted to go here. I just want to like highlight the, the intuition. This is what matters. Like so, whenever you see like these gradients or derivatives, this is saying like how much the error of the network or the performance of the network changes if you change this one particular weight. So, and then that tells you if you should make it larger or smaller. That's what backpropagation is doing. Okay, cool. So, it seems like we have everything that we need, right? We can just input an image here and we get a probability of the thing being a cat. Why do you need anything else? Why is this not enough? If you're processing images. People have tried to use and have used actually neural nets to process images for decades. Why are now everybody talking about this new model? So the reason is in a normal, like a standard neural net, there is no assumption that these numbers are related. This could be like the age of the person, uh, how, uh, how tall the person is, and I don't know, something else. These numbers are completely independent, like you don't assume that there's any relation between them necessarily. But if you're processing an image, and this is like the value of pixel 1, and this is the value of pixel 2, they are probably related, right? They're probably similar because images are not random, like the colors don't change randomly in an image. So what CNNs do is they exploit the similarities between, like nearby inputs probably have nearby uh, similar values. That's, and by exploiting that kind of stuff, you can get uh, much more powerful networks to learn about images or sounds or things that have this like spatial properties, like spatial correlations. So uh, again, so you could have like something like this, but let's suppose you're not you're tr you're trying to construct just a regular neural net. Let's say this is a small image; it's just a 20 by 28 by 28 pixel image. So you would have 784 inputs. And let's say you have 100 neurons here. How many weights would you have just in the first layer of this neural net? So you have 100 neurons here. Each one is connected to 700 pixels. So 700 times 100. That's like set almost 80,000 weights just in the first layer of the network, which is a lot. I mean, right nowadays it's not a lot, but it's, it's a bunch of numbers. Maybe you can do better. So convolutional networks, what they do is they, they allow you to more easily learn features like this, the ones that I used as an example, like is there a tail somewhere here? Is this thing a four-legged animal or not? Um, they can uh, more easily learn features like this that help you in classifying the image. And they do that by using, probably you guys in the back can't see this, um, they use uh, filters. And this is a concept that comes from uh, image processing, which maybe you guys have heard of. I'm going to explain what these things are. So people, sometimes they talk about uh, deep neural nets and convolutional neural nets as if they were the same. They're, sometimes they are. But deep neural nets just mean, uh, all that means is that you have a neural network with lots of layers. Uh, there's nothing new. So the main difference here is that if you have a convolutional neural net, 
at the first layers of this neural net, they implement what is called a convolution, which is something, it's like a, this mathematical operation that you, that you execute based on what are, uh, what, based on filters. And I'm going to explain what this means. Are. So, how many of you have taken something like an image processing class? Everyone, okay, so you guys know what a filter is, right? You, you have like an image like this, and you could have a filter to detect vertical edges, which a filter is usually this small matrix that you, that you slide over the image, and the output of that, that matrix is basically something that allows you to detect whether there's a vertical edge in each one of these regions of the image. So you would get something like this. So it's an, another image, same dimensions as this one, where you have like pixels that are on, in regions where that contain vertical edges and pixels that are off, so they are black in regions where there are no vertical edges. You could have a different fil uh, filter to detect horizontal edges, same thing. You've got something like this, it's a new image where the pixels that are on are uh, the regions of the original image where you have <coughs> horizontal edges. And the pixels could have, it's not just like, it's not binary, it's zero or one. So for example, this part here of the image not completely horizontal, but it's not vertical either. So probably get like this intermediate activation given by the filter. Anyone, every, does this make sense? Everyone knows about this? All right, cool. So you could have more complicated filters, like filters to detect whether there are eyes in the picture. It's going to be a different filter. Uh, filter got something like this, looks kind of like a demon. Um, but, so, uh, so why would you use this kind of filters in a neural net? For an image? For images, yeah. Well, I guess it's to resemble the way we see things. We tend to detect edges and construct images of, of, of separate objects. Right. So yeah. you want to train your network to be able to recognize the same objects in a scene as, as we do. Right. So that, that's, a right. that's right. So these filters, they give you a higher level information about the image. The original information was just a bunch of pixels, just like numbers. <coughs> And it's really difficult to interpret that num those numbers. But if you have filters like this, now you have a much more like a pre-processed information about the image that tells you if these <coughs> numbers are high, are large, probably there are eyes in the picture. And that information is really useful to uh, if you're trying to solve the problem of detecting whether there's a face here or not. So that's the intuition about why filters are help helpful. They get this higher level information about the picture. So, but the, then the question is which filters you should use if you're trying to classify images. It depends on what the images are, right? If they are cats, maybe you need some filters to detect whiskers and uh, whatever. If you're trying to classify furniture, it depends. You need filters that may be useful for identifying a table or <coughs> chairs. You could create manually like hundreds of these future, uh, filters and try to use them. You can do that manually. The magic here is that these convolutional networks, they learn which f uh, filters are going to help you. So they automate that process. You don't have to do this on your own. And it's pretty cool actually. You can see the filters that they are learning. So essentially they are learning which properties of a picture, of like a set of pictures, are, do you need to understand in some sense to be able to classify those images correctly. Okay. Uh, so that's the intuition. So let me give you an example. Let's say uh, you have this CNN. I haven't shown exactly how this works yet. And let's say I'm, uh, I have this problem of someone writes down it's either an X or an O. And I, so an image, in this case is an 8 by 8 image. And I just want this network to predict the probability of the thing that I wrote down. So there's like, I scan this. The probability of this being a 1, uh, an X or an O. Any questions? No? Right. Um, so why is this difficult? One of the reasons this is difficult is that whenever you write down X or an O, you could, the, like the X could be translated a little bit, or it could be rotated, or it could be like smaller, or it could be thicker. Um, but then, like imagine that you're giving as inputs to that network <coughs> these pixels directly. How similar is this image and this image? They might be very different, right? Like most of the pixels here in the middle, I mean, some of them are the same, but not all of them. But we humans, we can sort of like look and magically we understand that it's the same thing, even though individual pixels might be different. And CNNs, they help us to deal with this kind of problem. Right? So 
specifically, why is it difficult for a network, if I give you two examples of an X like this, why is it hard for a network to understand that these images, even though the individual pixels may be completely different, both of them are instances of the same class? And it's because of the reason that I just said. Uh, you, if you look at what the network's actually seeing, it's a bunch of numbers like this. And most of these numbers might be completely different. Right? And this is not difficult for us because we don't, when we see an X, we don't see like minus one plus one, we, we see something else. So let's assume that I give you specific filters that I, con I constructed, and I'm giving you, you don't have to worry about that. I constructed f uh, filters, three filters that are going to help us in this task of classifying whether something is an X or if it's an O. And the three filters are, there's one filter that is, uh, allows you to detect whether there's a descending diagonal line in a specific region of the task. Another filter that helps you to detect whether there's an ascending diagonal line. And a third filter that allows you to detect whether there's like a small X-like thing somewhere on the figure, right? These filters are given to you. So what happens if you apply th those filters to this, this image? You would get something like an indication of whether there's a uh, uh, descending diagonal line here, descending here, descending here. So it's like high activation numbers in regions where these features, these characteristics, these three things uh, occur. Right, so you get something like this. So the purple filter that detects descending diagonal lines would be highly activated here and here. The filter that detects ascending diagonal lines would be probably highly activated here and here. And the filter that detects like small x figures would be highly activated here. So now these two things are much easier to compare. Right, you could, like if you look uh, at these two figures from really far away, and you imagine that these are kind of like really large pixels, you would get something like this. So like on the top left, you have a descending diagonal line. Here, there's nothing ascending diagonal line. And now you can compare these two things, and, and you realize that they're the same. Right, so this is what CNNs are doing. Does that make sense so far? The question is, how do you know which filters to use? So the, the specific filters that I showed, that I've shown, are these three ones, so a filter to detect a descending diagonal line looks like a matrix like this. Detect uh, axis and detect ascending lines. Does anyone know why the filters look like this? Why they, they are like these three by three matrices? Why is a filter a matrix? It's because of the way that they are used. And so that there's this mathematical operation called a convolution, and what it does is this. Let's say this is the image that I'm, that I'm analyzing. And I want to run this filter. Again, this is the filter that detects whether there's a descending diagonal line in this region, or this region, or this region, and so on. So how do I apply this, this filter to this specific part of the image? Does anyone know how you do that? Uh, I want to say you apply the convolution operation. What is that? Uh, what is that again? You um, you uh, sum up the product of all the overlapping uh, fields or exactly. Uh, exactly. pixels. Exactly. So when when we say when we talk about convolution, it's just this idea of like you take this matrix and you multiply this number with this number, this one, this one, sort of like an element-wise multiplication. And you add all of them, and you in this case you divide by nine. It's like you take the average because there are nine numbers, right? And you do that uh, by applying this matrix here, and then you move the the matrix a little bit to the right, and you keep doing that. And out of each one of these steps, you get one number, which is like how active this this feature, like how sure the filter is that there's a descending diagonal line in this region, and in that region, and the other region. So you keep sliding that window. And uh, by computing this uh, multiplication and addition, and you divide it by nine. Uh, in this case, like if you apply this filter to this region, all the numbers match, right? So one and one minus one minus one. So you you would get like these are the element-wise products. You add them up and you divide by nine. So one plus one nine times divided by nine. This is one. So the number that you assign to this pixel, the one in the middle is one. 
what is the uh, intuitive interpretation of this thing being one? That you have a 100% chance of there being a bag in the Exactly. You have, you, you have a 100% certainty that there's a descending diagonal line in this region here. If you apply that same filter, this one, to this uh, region, you don't get a 1 anymore because some of these pixels don't match, like these ones don't match. So when you add everything up, you get 0.55. And what is the interpretation again? It's, well, it's not exactly a descending line. It sort of looks, part of it looks like a descending line. This part does, but these other pixels are off. So that's, and then you can just apply this filter everywhere and you would get something like this. This is called a feature map. Okay, so a feature map is just high, so dark number, di, Jesus Christ, dark cells are low activation uh, uh, outcomes of the filters and large values are high activation outputs of the filters. Yeah. But it doesn't need to be between minus one and one, right? Yeah. Uh, well, in this case, it should be because all numbers are yeah, minus one. And but normally you don't need this. Uh, That's right. Yeah. yeah, the output could be anything, but uh, yeah. So if you look at this feature map, what is the, can you see any patterns here? What is white and what is dark? Well, the descending diagonal lines are uh, the most activated, and uh, also it's pretty interesting that uh, those four uh, sort of making a plus around the little x. This one? Seem to be the least no, it's activated. negative. It's my, minus point. Yeah, no, this, yeah, exactly. They seem to be the, the, the absolute least activated yes. of all of them. Right. That's interesting. Yeah, it is interesting. So. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. she's, she's right, like the, the regions in this feature map that are really highly active are the regions of the image where it seems like that there's a descending line. And the image, the parts that are really dark <coughs> are the parts of the image where the filter is almost sure that there is no descending line. Now, why there's no descending line here? I mean, yes, it makes sense. If you look at this window, there's no descending, maybe here, but anyways. So that's what this is doing. This is called a feature map again. It detects the presence of a particular thing, in this case, descending lines, on this original image. You could have different fi uh, filters. So if I have these three filters that I mentioned before to detect descending lines, small axis ascending lines, and you do the convolution of these filters with which each one of the like, copies of the original image, you would get these feature maps. So this one is telling you where in the original image you had descending lines. This in the original image where you had ascending lines, and this in the original image where you had a small x. So this one is only highly activated in the middle because that's the only place where you have the small x. Okay, so far? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so you do this. This is what is called a convolutional layer in a CNN. It's just like a stack of many filters. In this case, I, I gave you the filters, but the network is actually going to learn what they, they should be. It's just a stack of these things, and you apply the image to each one of those. Uh, you do the convolution, and you get this as output this stack <coughs> of feature maps, which are uh, other images, just like the original one, but uh, almost broke something uh, of the features that you're trying to detect. All right, so. Convolutional layer takes as input as an image, convolves many filters, returns a stack of filter, uh, filtered images that uh, indicate where in this original thing some <coughs> prop, some specific things occur. Now, how are you going to use this information? Like this is higher level information about the original image, right? It's telling you whether uh, there's a descending line in specific, specific regions of, the, of this. So how can you use these <coughs> three images now in the task of trying to classify what is happening? So one thing that you could do is you could just create this large neural net where you give as input the information about <coughs> this pixel of this feature map. So is there a descending line here? Is there a descending line here? Is there, a is there a, like an X here? Is there an ascending line here? So you just give the activation values of each one of these, I don't know how many pixels there are here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, 
49, 49, 49 <coughs> times 3, less than 150. I don't know what number, number that is. 147 maybe. Um, so you could give this 147 numbers as inputs to a neural net. Would that make the classification task easier or harder than if you just give as input the, these pixels directly? What do you guys think? Harder. Harder? Why? Because it's more stuff to look at. Right. That's that's one. <coughs> so there are two. Like it makes it easier if you look at one way, but it made it it makes it harder uh, because of the reason that he just said. Originally, you had like 64 numbers to give as input to the network. Now you have like 150. So it seems like we need a much larger network. And that's a bad idea. But let's assume that we can ignore that this is a larger network. The information itself, would it make it e that is given to the network, would it make it easier or harder for it to detect? Right now we have extracted some of the features, so probably it would be uh, easier. Right, so in some sense, it should make things easier in the sense that now the network is not just looking at random pixels, but it's looking at this higher level information about descending lines and ascending lines and small axes, <coughs> and those are the things that you need to compose in some sense to understand if there's a, an X, right? How do you detect if there's an X? Essentially, if there's a descending line here, ascending line here, X, ascending, descending. So if you have those five information about this, which is exactly what these filters are giving you, then it's almost trivial to know if there's an X. And the same thing uh, with an O. What kind of features would help you to understand if there's an O? You have like an ascending line, a descending line, uh, no X here, descending, ascending, right? So you can like draw uh, an X or draw an O, an o uh, by composing this line. So that's the intuition. But as he said, originally we had 81 numbers to analyze, and now we have, a, I actually got this right, 147 numbers. So the network needs to be much, much bigger. So what, what do you do? Just create a larger net. That's like you could just create a huge net. Yes. Uh, we can have four <coughs> layers. What is that? We want to reduce the number, the, the size of the image. Right. So like we intuitively we don't need this kind of like high resolution indication of where the descending lines are. We can make this lower resolution, <coughs> smaller lower resolution, and so that we get a smaller number of. Uh, values to analyze. And that's exactly what the pooling layer does in a CNN. So it just decreases the, the resolution of something. So um, how does that work? Usually you need to pick two, two parameters in one of those layers. You need to pick a window size, and I'm going to show what that means, and a stripe. So let's say, I'm just going to show how max pooling works. Max pooling is one type of technique that allows you to make, to lower the dimension of each one of those feature maps. Is that okay? Yeah. So what it does is like this. Let's say I decided that the window size is 2 by 2. So I'm going to analyze this feature map by looking at 2 by 2 windows. And the stripe means like how, how is this window going to move across the original feature map. So if, if it's going to be like pixel by pixel or if it's going to be every 2 pixels it's going to jump around. So in this case, it's a 2 by 2, it's right 2, so it's going to move like this. And what the, the max pooling like operation or layer does in this case is when it's analyzing this part of the feature map, it just checks what is the largest number and returns that number. So the largest number here is 1, right? So you would get a 1 here on this lower resolution image of this higher res resolution feature map. And then you move the window, because the stride is 2, you move it uh, there, and so on. So, but before we go there, what is the intuitive meaning of this number being 1? It means that in the top left corner of the higher resolution, there's a descending line? There's a descending line somewhere, <coughs> right? If there's a 1 somewhere here, you know that there's a descending line because you're just taking the max, so you know that there's a one somewhere. You don't know exactly where. So, 
a one there means that in this small region, there is a descending line for sure, somewhere. You don't know exactly where, but you don't care. You just care that it's somewhere on the top left of the image, there's a descending line. And then if you move the window here, you do the max, you get 0 0.3. What does that mean? Again, there's a sort of like a descending line, you're not completely sure, because it's 0 point, it's 33% sure there, that there's a descending line somewhere on this region. So if you keep doing that, you'd get this lower resolution feature map, which is 4x4, four four, so 16 numbers. <coughs> but it's, it still captures essentially the same information, right? That in the original image, where are the uh, descending lines, which are basically... Does that make sense? People are looking at this kind of funny. What do you do in, like, in the edge from the last? Do you just take the last two? There are, two, there are many possibilities. Uh, one thing that people sometimes do, you just repeat this column. Like um, if you're, yeah. right? Yeah, like or you just ignore it. There, there are many things that you can do. Do you repeat the last column or do you put the first column on the other side? Like four it depends on what you're trying to do, but in an image, usually you just repeat the same pixels here. Because if you repeat, like imagine that this is a cat. Yeah. It wouldn't make sense to copy like well, maybe if it's a completely symmetric picture of the face of the cat, but usually, like the pixels on the left of your face are not the same as the pixels on the right. Do we use zero padding? That's what do you mean? Just adding zeros here? Yeah. Yeah, you can do that. Doesn't matter. It's, it's it usually same doesn't thing. matter a lot what you yeah. do on the edges. Same thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you determine the, the sprite and the the size of the of the pooling? Magic. No, it's just trial and error. Like, it's not completely magic, but... So the, the window size depends on how large you want the network to be, essentially. Because if the window size is really big, you're going to get a much smaller output here. So it's like a... It's a coarser view of the image. So you're just saying, on this, like, one-fourth top left, is there something that looks like a descending line, but it's very like low resolution view. So it makes it easier in the sense that you're looking like, it's almost like you're looking from very far away, but then because you're not looking at the details, maybe it's going to get some things wrong. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering how severe is the effect of the spooling uh, on the uh, accuracy of the classification? Will, will it strongly affect the results? No. no. Usually, I mean, it, it really depends. This is very strong. It depends strongly on the application. And if you look at the papers that use this kind of networks, part of the contribution of the papers is exactly to determine if you should do max pooling and when you should do max pooling. So you shouldn't always do this. And we're going to talk about this later on. It's kind of like a trial and error thing. If you look at papers by Google and Microsoft and like the guys that are actually doing this on large data sets, they show like this, whatever like new architecture they came up with. It's like it's not just a few layers. It's like 500 layers of crazy random combinations of match pooling and the convolutional things. They just keep trying things until it works. Yeah. Uh, I think we get the, the striding part. Okay. The stri so the stride means like how is the window going to slide over the original feature map? So if if the stride is one, the Im the window is going to start here. And then, because the stride is one, it's just going to move by one pixel. If the stride is two, the window is here, and then you move it by two pixels. Would you, would you ever <coughs> stride it by just one? Sure, but then you get these overlaps, right? Yeah. So would you have eight like, vertical numbers then? If you did the stride by one here, would you have like eight numbers that way? Let's see. I don't know. Uh, you would have one, two, three. Four, five, six. And it depends on what you do on the edges also. So if you just ignore the edges, you would have six. If you copy these columns, you would have eight. So how big the window should be and how large the stride should be, those are things that you have to just really depends on the application. But this is the intuition. Like you basically want you have a feature map that tells you where a specific feature occurs, in this case the sending lines, and you don't need this much resolution. You just want to know sort of vaguely where the descending lines are. So you do this operation that gets you a smaller, a lower resolution image at the end. That's what max pooling is. The other question is why are we doing max and not just taking the average? 
Because if you take the average activation, like on a two by two window, you get some, some useful information out of these two, right? So why not do the, the average? <coughs> Um, so, for that, as, uh, that specific neuron, you actually do only care about the, the, the descending line. Mm -hmm. and so, I guess all other information isn't that relevant. So, in some cases, doing the max works. In some other cases, you can do the average, and it always also works. It's kind of, uh, so, it, when you start reading these papers, you see that there's a lot of engineering. Like, there's no specific reason why max, taking the max is always the best thing. Sometimes taking the average also works. So, that's one of the key messages that you should remember about this talk. That, of course, there's math behind this. There's, like, gradients and equations that make this look very complicated. But in the end, you're just trying to learn filters and how big the filters should be, how many filters you should have, how like what should be described, that's kind of trial and error. Like it's not completely a scientific process. All right, uh, that's max pooling. What time is it? It's three. So maybe we can take a break now. All right, so let's do a 15 minute break and we come back at three. <coughs> Okay, cool. So we stopped uh, here talking about max pooling, right? So we have these feature maps, and the idea is that these feature maps they give you this higher level information about where the descending lines are in the original image, where the ascending lines are, and so on. And we do max pooling, so we get a lower resolution uh, version of this thing, which is easier to analyze just because now we have fewer numbers. And then what do you do with the CNN? You just like do max pooling on each one of these initially higher resolution feature maps, you get lower resolution ones. And now now you can actually give to like a classic neural net, uh, you can give these numbers as inputs directly. And now intuitively this should make sense uh, to the network. Why? Because the network can just under, like it's <coughs> one of the inputs is going to uh, specify, is, other, is there a descending line at the top? Is there an X at the top? Is there a descending line at the top? Right. So if you know these three information, uh, these three numbers, if you just have access to those three numbers, like there's a there's a descending line here, there's not no X, there's no descending line, ascending line. What would you guess that the person drew? So there's descending, no X, no ascending. The uh, descending diagonal line, or the or the top half of an X, top left half of an X, maybe. Right. So, what would be the class that you would predict? An X or an O? X. An X, right? Yes. If you, uh, how would you probably the network? How would it probably detect that there's a O? You could see something like there's a descending line here because that's like this part of the O. There's no X here, and there's no ascending line. So now you have this information that is much easier for the network to process because it just checks combinations of where the ascending lines and descending lines are. And by just checking which ones happen at the same time, you can probably guess whether the class is an X or an O. Does that make sense? That's, that's like 90% of what a CNN is doing. So you just give, this is a classic neural net, just as I showed at the beginning of the talk. And these numbers are like the inputs to the network. So in this case, you would have 1, 2, 3, 4, 16 times 3, 48. So you have 48 numbers. What was the original number of values for the original image? How many numbers you had? It was an 8 by 8, so you had 64 numbers. Now we have fewer. We have 48. But the, the big advantage here doesn't come from the fact that we went from 64 to 48. Like that's not a big difference. The big difference again is that these filters are giving you a much easier to interpret information about which parts of the image contain different features that are helpful for classifying if it's an X or an O. All right, so the reduction is, it is an advantage, but that's not the main point. So these features that were identified 
by the filters, they can be used to this, uh, as input to a classical uh, neural net instead of the pixels directly. They make the classification task easier. So as, like, well, as a very simple type of CNN could look something like this. You have the image, you have a convolutional layer, which is a comp like a, you're stacking three filters, which in this case were given to you. As a result of applying the convolution of these three filters with the original image, you get three feature maps, which are the same resolution as the original image. But then you need to lower the resolution of this thing, otherwise you get too many numbers to analyze. You do max pooling, and then these numbers go and enter as inputs to the neural map. And then here you just use standard backpropagation. Everything okay so far? All right, uh, there's one thing missing. In standard neural nets, whenever you computed like the output of a neuron, which was based like on the inputs and the weights, the output went through an activation function. Right? It was not just not just a, a weighted sum of the inputs. But here, it seems like we're, we don't have this concept of an, uh, an activation function. We're just taking, like, just making this lower resolution, and that's all we're doing. So what sometimes people realize that helps is if before feeding this thing to the network, you apply some nonlinear activation function, just like the sigmoid function or the hyperbolic <coughs> function, like all these things that you probably studied. And so you could use like a sigmoid. In CNNs, people usually use something else that is called this ReLU. Uh, have you guys heard of this? No? All right, so this is a different type of activation function. So a uh, sigmoid function, which is like the, the exponential, exponential function that I showed before, 1 over 1 plus exponential bunch of stuff, it looks something like this. So the inputs to the sigmoid activation function could be any number from minus infinity to plus infinity, but the sigmoid m squishes them, like it maps them to the interval between 0 and 1. It has this shape. It's one possible activation function that you could use. Lots of people use it. This other thing, the ReLU activation function, it does something else. It can also take as you put any number from minus infinity to plus infinity, but all the negative numbers are mapped to zero, and all the positive numbers are unchanged. So if you look at this, it's almost like it's a very rough approximation of the sigmoid, at least in some parts of it. It looks weird. So why would people use this instead of a sigmoid? Because it's faster to compute. That's one of the reasons. It's faster to compute. It's just like the implementation is just a max. This is really fast. A, a sigmoid you need like to compute fractions and exponentials. But there's a, another reason, and this I think it's a very empirical reason. When you're doing something, well, let me just show you what happens if you apply these activation functions to these numbers. So like if you're applying a sigmoid, you would just take this number and apply it through the sigmoid activation function, you would get a number from 0 to 1. I don't know exactly which one. If you do the ReLU, it just it basically keeps all the positive numbers as they are and maps the negative numbers to zero. So you you get something like this. To me this looks pretty insane. Like it seemed like the this feature map was pretty reasonable and then you apply this function and it now I don't know. It's weird. I mean I can still see the descending line here, but there's a bunch of dark spots which are strange. Uh, so my interpretation is what is a negative number here? A, a negative number means that you have some, some amount of certainty that there's no descending line. Right? You're pretty sure that there's no descending line if it's minus 1. You're sort of not so confident if it's minus 1. Maybe there, you don't know. So this is just saying I'm absolutely sure there's no descending line. So it's just like making this like a harder. You're sort of faking that you're very confident about whether there's a descending line. But it does help. But that's not the main point. The main point, I think, is that it helps with a problem known as the vanishing gradient. Have you, have you heard of that? So if you have uh, deep neural nets, usually you have not only like two layers, but you have hundreds of layers. How does backpropagation work? That's the reason why I mentioned this at the beginning of the talk. You, prop, you give an input to the network. You propagate it forward. You get the output. And then based on the error, how do you update the weights? 
What was the process? What were the numbers, the values that we had to compute for each one of the neurons? <coughs> 